Good afternoon, Hello. everyone, uh, and welcome, David. Thank you so much for doing this. It's a real um, thrill for me. Um, yesterday, I, uh, I interviewed the, the head of the CIA up here, but I mistakenly uh, came out with the questions for you um, in my... Uh, so um, I, had, I had to wing it. I, was, I wasn't really going to ask him about spicy noodles, but... Um, <laughs> For you, let me start with, what, what is your drone policy? Uh, <laughs> actually, you know what, what is your drone policy? Because uh, one of the things that you're doing, uh, and, and how many people, first of all, have eaten in one of his restaurants or eaten food? Wow, Thank you. good stuff. Um, the, the, you're in a period of pretty rapid expansion, and you're also not just expand, expanding terrestrially, you're expanding uh, in, 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 in format and in ways you deliver food to people, including Ando in, in New York, which is delivery. How far are we away from, from drone-delivered food? Um, I laughed initially. I think it will happen in our lifetimes, probably. Yeah. You know, I know nothing about drone technology, but all the tech people I talk to think that it's probably going to happen, or something that's an automated uh, delivery system. The, um, why don't we just uh, do this? Let's, uh, for, for those few people here who don't know your story, uh, you're, you're part of this generation of, of chef entrepreneurs, one of the most successful in America. Take one or two minutes and, 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 and walk through how you went from a guy, uh, Georgetown Prep to Trinity, you're, you're, you're cooking, you come out of a restaurant family, but how did you go from chef to a, a, almost a kind of global presence. Just, just, just walk us through real brief. <laughs> um, so, you know, born and raised in this, in this town. Uh, my dad worked his entire life to make sure I was never going to work in restaurants. Um, that was his dream for you, right? Yeah, yeah, to do anything but what I'm doing right now. Right. Because um, he, know he knows how hard it is. And, uh, you know, I had a few false starts in college that I wanted to go to the culinary world. And then after I started to work in... Uh, like a real job, like a desk job. I realized that. What was your you know, desk job? I was doing some stuff in finance. I had interned at Payne Weber for like two years doing private wealth asset management in Connecticut. And uh, that was just. That sounds just, thrilling. Yes. Yeah. You just shuffle papers around when you're intern. That's right. all you do as an intern anyway. So right. um, I just realized that that life is something that I was headed towards the middle, right? I just, even if I was good at it, I would be terrible at it. So. And it's not something I wanted to do, and I thought that the food industry, I didn't know if it was going to be my calling, but for someone that was allergic to work, uh, a year into it, I was like, wow, I don't think I've taken a day off in like a year, and I'm working seven days a week. Right. And maybe this is something that I should be doing. And so how did you learn how to innovate to go from one restaurant to what you're doing now? That happened because I feel like we had everything on the line, right? If we, if we took Invest as the first restaurant, I don't think I'd be here today um, because we had... Failure wasn't an option. You did this off a loan from your father? First one, and then I took a bank loan out, the second one. And we just continued to put our money in time and time again. And when you're in that situation, you do whatever you, you just learn so many things that you never thought you were gonna learn before. Before, because you could just sort of delegate that stuff. Oh, you, this person's handling that. But besides just making the food, myself and the people around me had to take care of everything else. Did you have a mentor? What, what, did you have a plan to get to where you are today? How did it happen? <clears throat> So I've learned that growing organically means not having any fucking idea what you're doing. <laughs> so, for instance... That might be the signature quote of the entire Washington Night <clears throat> Forum, by the way. I want people to write that down. Our first restaurant outside New York City, just to show you how we had no idea what we were doing, was in Sydney, Australia. Right. For the, con for the, the commute was so yeah. obviously... Uh, yeah. how, how, did so you, how did you come to that decision? That seems almost drug-induced as, a, as, yeah, a, as I mean, a bad decision. It just seemed like a good idea, and that's what we were able to do. Because you've never been to Australia, so well, why I've not? Well, I mean, I liked Australia, and I, this, is, this is what go th went through my head. Like, on a, <laughs> on a map, it's only like four inches away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> when you look at that, you're like, like oh, I said, that's not that far away. Like I said, it was drug-induced, yeah, yeah. right? It sounds like a drug-induced decision. So we opened up in Australia, and the next restaurant we opened up was in Toronto. So there was no real plan in place. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but you somehow, you somehow got there. Let's talk about um, talk about some of the, the the policy challenge. We were talking before a little bit about the, the the policy challenges that face a rapidly growing 
uh, business in an area that more and more people are interested in and more and more people are eating out than ever and more and more people are demanding good food. You, you're under tremendous strain in any number of, of areas. One of them is, is maintaining uh, the quality of a essentially blue collar workforce in a, a very white collar world. Talk about the pressure on you to keep your food affordable while maintaining the, 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 the lives uh, and, and supporting the lives of almost a thousand employees at this yep. point? Go, go into that a little bit, and then we'll turn to immigration. Well, I can... <laughs> and then Donald Trump. I, <laughs> and then we'll go back to Sydney, Australia. When I started cooking in 1999-2000, I got paid nine seventy five an hour. The current wage average, I think, in New York City is maybe twelve fifty or 13 maybe tops. Obviously, we want to pay our cooks as much as humanly possible. That's, I'm always going to be an advocate for the cook, not the front of the house, even though I now I realize how important the front of the house is. So servers can, you know, a couple of our restaurants, a server can make $100,000 on like a 50-hour work week tops um, in terms of uh, maybe more depending on the week. But the cook is sort of, sort of stuck at, you know, there's a couple places where we're paying $15 an hour, and that's just not enough. Everything's gotten more expensive in New York City, but how we pay our cooks. And that's a struggle that I have, is how do we re-engineer our business because I want to pay my cooks as much as I can. And uh, I want them to have a better quality of life because, again, like, it's a blue collar labor. We're in a white collar environment, work environment now. But we're still paying you know, people not as much as I would like. And where does it break? Well, it breaks, I think, on the consumer's end. I mean, most of the responsibility is on our shoulders. But I think the consumer has to understand that food should be more expensive, not just for us, but for the farmers, for the environment, for the for the just many costs that are sort of hidden. So um, it's something that we're really trying to figure out. We, we toyed around with uh, unsuccessfully with a no-tip policy restaurant. Uh, the margins in a business, even a very successful restaurant, are slim to none. So the first, pe first thing, people have to get that out of their head, that like a busy restaurant doesn't mean that they're just raking in the money. Um, so it's, it's going to take some time to figure out, but I tell people when I get criticism from some other people, they're like, well, you're not paying your cooks enough money. I'm like, we're trying to make this work for everybody. I mean, for that same reason, like, do you pay trash, people that pick up your trash or people that clean up the house, people that clean up bathrooms? That's the same sort of right. labor force. Right. You should be paying them as much money as possible, too. And talk about how this interacts with the immigration controversy in America right now. Without our Hispanic labor force, there'd be no restaurants in America. Um, and I, I mean, like I mean that, like, but why don't it people would just die out, right? Who's going to make, it? not just who, like, I'm trying to say stuff that's not going to get me in a lot of trouble right now. No, but, no, no, say stuff that um, gets me in a lot of trouble right now. <laughs> it's, um, I have a lot of my guys, that's what they talk about. They're sort of scared about the future. In so, this moment, in this particular yeah, political where moment. Where they might be f completely free, or they're, now tougher standards where I may not be able to hire someone that I very much want to hire. And that sucks. Or I have a guy that's been with me 10 plus years and there's people that live with him in his apartment that he's afraid might have to leave. Like that's a terrible thing to go to work every day and worry about. Right. So um, yeah, I think things need to change all across the board, particularly on why how don't people under, Why do you think people don't understand this? People don't want to know anything about their food. It's just the truth. People don't want to know that, well, some, uh, something died to make this burger you're eating. You right. know, somebody picked this piece of fruit for your salad. So. Um, let's talk about, uh, just for a minute, scale and the, and the challenges that come with, with scale. Um, I, I, I'm bringing up, what, I'm dredging up what might be an unpleasant subject for you, uh, the, the P, a recent Pete Wells uh, review in the New York Times that was written about in, 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 in a New Yorker profile. The, the, Pete Wells thinks you're a tremendously gifted chef. The, 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 the critique, I think, almost is that he wants, in an almost nostalgic way, for you to be that chef that you were 10 or 15 years ago, cooking amazing things in one spot. Uh, do, you, is there any, do you give any credence to the idea that 
your, at your level, at the very, very top of your industry, that you guys are spread too thin and that, and that your restaurants are no longer as original as they once were because you're doing too much? <clears throat> Feel free to make this a commentary on journalism as well. Uh, obviously, I disagree with Pete. I think it's unfortunate that he's shaping the culinary universe in New York City. He's taken down a lot of sort of the titans from Thomas Keller to Danielle Ballou to the Spotted Pig team, so on and so forth. And you know what? If we didn't deliver, we didn't deliver. And that's something that I've like trying to tell myself. But at the end of the day, like these guys and women are doing amazing work. And because of their amazing work, they're growing. I don't know how we should be punished for trying to take care of our guys. And if you ask every one of them, Jose Andres is a perfect example here in DC, if you talk to Jose, he's gonna say, I'm in this to take care of my guys. I've already done enough to take care of myself, and as I mature and as I get older, you know, it's like, we shouldn't be doing the same things when we were 25 Do you think years reviewing old. is becoming entertainment? <laughs> it is entertainment, and that's what I, 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 that's what sells, right? It sells because you're either criticizing someone or praise. Praise doesn't sell. Mediocrity, mediocre reviews don't sell. Um, so you think people are looking for the takedown. Yeah, you live in a very un un unforgiving media environment now, and that everybody's an expert, and everybody on TripAdvisor or Yelp is a food critic. Is that is that is, is, is am I wrong in saying that it's rougher <laughs> now than ever? It's rougher now than ever. But what I for someone that's complained for the past sort of seven years about this, I now realize that we just have to get better. You know, that's that's it. Like how we outreach, how we talk to people that write reviews from a blogger's perspective or someone that writes a post on Instagram, you know, they just want to be acknowledged, right? And if we didn't do that in our food, that's on us. Hmm. And that's just what I'm thinking about now. Talk about, this is a very Washington heavy audience, talk about in the remaining minutes that we have, talk about the, the food scene here. I mean, you're, 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 a, you're a local boy, you made your name in, uh, in New York. Uh, give us a assessment of how Washington's food scene has changed and if it's changed for the better. And also tell them what you like here. Um, food tell me in what DC, you like here. I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> food's better than ever across the country. It's really hard to find a city that doesn't have a spectacular restaurant. DC, and I can say this from my own <clears throat> cooks that have worked at other top restaurants, I mean, people are looking for some stability where it's more than just the next hot thing. And I think uh, at least from the cook's perspective, people want to build on this momentum. So it's not just the flash in the pan. Because there's some great things happening in D.C. Um, <clears throat> probably the hottest, one of the hottest restaurants in the country is Aaron Silverman's Roses Luxury and Al Pineapple and Pearls. <clears throat> and the thing that I would like other people in D.C. to recognize is, oh, like, why is he so, su so successful? Aaron worked at the best restaurants, not just in America, but like all over the place for many years. Every year was a year or two. He used to work for me. So, um, Do you consider this as good as New York now in terms of creativity? I don't think New York is as strong as it used to be, not because it's doing less you know, excellent work. It's just that everything else has been elevated. Right? It's harder to distinguish. Right? New York used to be like Ted Williams. You know, it's, never, it's harder to hit 400 now because everything else is better. Right? Right. So um, that's why. I'm never going to knock on New York and I'm not going to knock on my hometown of DC, but um, it's better to eat than ever before. I'd like to see more ethnic eateries, and I even hate using the word ethnic eateries. I just think DC could embrace its diversity. There's so many good you know, things that you might not normally think, oh, let's go out to dinner. That was one right? person clapping for yeah. diversity, by the way. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, t uh, Tell like, them one, oh, like yeah. Ethiopian foods here is great. You have great yeah. Korean and that's food. that's been for 30 years. Yeah, yeah, but people still don't know that, right? right? You have an amazing Ecuadorian population, uh, Salvadorian food. Like, no one eats pupusas. Right. Not that I know of. They're delicious here. There's the, so, now you've alienated all, the pupusa yeah, lobby. Well, it's all here. Yeah. I think people need to go a little bit further. Right. The technology is there where they can locate the stuff, so go out there and, and eat it. Do you, one more thing. Do you ever dream of chucking it all I mean, you have a, this empire, you're sitting on top of a little bit of an empire now. Do you ever think, uh, I just want to go into the kitchen in, in, in one place and cook all day? Yeah, I mean, 
all the time. Um, if you talk to a lot of my friends, they all want to sort of think, they talk about abandoning it all. And I joke about burning it all down to have some freedom. And I think about this probably 15 to 30 minutes every day. Um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, because now I'm in a position where I don't know what I'm necessarily doing. You know, uh, trained to cook, not to manage. And managing, I don't, I don't love managing. It's, it's not that much fun. But it's something I have to get better at. Do you want to get better at it? Do you want to just grow this and, and sell it and then go find something else? I've had the opportunity to sell before and I didn't, right? Of course I'd like to make money, but it's got to be in a way where I'm not going to have survivor's guilt. And I want to grow this company to the point where my team can benefit and the people that we purchase from can benefit. So uh, that's a great opportunity, right? So, um, you know, we'll see how far we can take this thing. But if it all collapses, you know, it's on, it's on my shoulders for sure. And if it all collapses, you can still go back and cook. I hope so. Yeah. Th Dave, thank, this is awesome. Thank you very much for Thank coming you guys. today. Thank you so much. This is great.